to welcome Claire Blanco this evening. And I'll hand you over to Claire, who's going to talk about getting into fungi adventures in mycology in Sussex. Right, well, hello everyone. Um, let me see if we can, yeah, move this on. So I originally put this talk together for the, the Friends of Benfield Valley, uh, for an audience of about 30 people in Hangleton Village Hall. So it's a bit of a different experience giving it to uh, hundreds of people over the internet. But I just thought I'd share some highlights from my journey into the world of mycology um, and getting into fungi. Um, right, let's get started. This is me. Um, I do the, as my day job, I work at the Sussex Biodiversity Record Centre based at the Sussex Wildlife Trust, but um, studying fungi, um, mycology is something that I do in my spare time as a hobby. And I write a blog about my sightings. Uh, and I'm also on Twitter, mostly talking about fungi and other nonsense. Um, so do feel free to kind of follow up those links at the end. Most of the photos, if unless it says otherwise, the photos that you see this evening are mostly taken by me on my phone while I'm out and about in Sussex. So the things you're seeing in this presentation are mostly things that you yourself can, can get out and find in Sussex. So I thought I'd start off because I always get questions about this. Um, some fungi are poisonous uh, and I think particularly in our culture, that's led to a, a real kind of culture of mycophobia. So I've, I've been out with people who are really interested in nature, uh, really into wildlife, but never really got involved with fungi. There's a, there's a sort of latent fear there of them because of their poisonous qualities. And it's true, some fungi are very poisonous. This, this is a, a death cap that I came across in Sussex. If you eat these, um, even a small amount of them, they can kill you. So fungi are to be respected. Um, but I'm very much a, an advocate for respect rather than fear, because I think if you if you study fungi, if you observe them, just kind of taking notice of their features, they're not going to do you any harm. Um, when you need to be really careful is, is if you get into tasting them or, or ingesting them. Uh, and that's not really my area of interest at all. So the other thing I get asked about a lot is edibility of fungi. Um, and that's just not something that I know a great deal about. My interest is in studying fungi and observing fungi for recording purposes. Um, and I'm always fascinated to come across the, the many different creatures which rely on fungi as a food source. So for me, I'm perfectly happy to leave the fungi uh, where they are, potentially take samples if I need to for recording purposes. Um, but eating wild fungi is just, it's never something that's particularly caught my interest. I'm more than happy to uh, make my dinner from some mushrooms I've picked up at the supermarket. Um, but obviously it is, it is a truth that some of the fungi that you can find growing wild in our countryside are edible and some of them are really prized um, for, their, for their culinary properties. Um, but be aware that for example, this species, the bearded tooth fungus, this is a protected species. Um, if you ever come across this, it should be recorded uh, so that people can be aware of its presence for conservation purposes. Um, but it's not not for the picking because it is a, a legally protected species. So where did my interest in uh, recording fungi begin? Well, thanks to my thanks to my mum, she actually dug out this this record a while ago from 1988. So I would have been nine um, out on a fungus foray under the auspices of Hazelmere Educational Museum, my mum tells me. Um, and I was I was quite interested to see this, just as my interest in in fungi was was starting to kind of emerge again. Because back in 1988, I've actually I've recorded a species here, found bachelor's button on a fallen tree. And this is this is bachelor's buttons. That's actually quite an old name for it. I think the the more sort of common name these days is black bulger. Um, but there's a record there from wherever I happen to be on this day. Unfortunately, I didn't write that down. Uh, and somebody must have been schooling me and observing fungi because there's all sorts of details here. Um, found a white toadstool under a fern. 
found a white toadstool with a fishy smell. So somebody there is sort of teaching me that you need to you need to observe all these wider details. You need to you need to smell them. You need to see what they're growing with. And I've and I've obviously picked that up. Um, and I believe it was this lady, Audrey Thomas, who would have who would have been leading the fungus foray that day, as she was a, a very experienced mycologist for a long time associated with Hazelmere Museum. And this would have been this would have been quite a bit before my time, but I can imagine I would have been very much like one of those school children there, kind of wrapped with attention, um, eager to learn more about natural history. It's a really fascinating subject. So that was it really for years. I, I kind of got got remember some very kind of engaging and interesting events when I was a kid. Um, but you know, you grow up, you get interested in other things. Um, still kind of had that interest in wildlife, but some of some of you may know I got, got distracted by things like butterflies for a while there. And it wasn't really until 2015 when I'd suddenly found myself with a new job working for the Sussex Wildlife Trust I'd, I'd managed to get shot of an extremely long and onerous commute every day so I suddenly had some more time on my hands and I was surrounded by people with an interest in wildlife um, and I was out for a walk on Boxing Day when quite often a lot of people have a bit of extra time on their hands over Christmas and I came across this ex this exact fungus here and I was just completely captivated by by its form it seemed so intricate uh, and this sort of lovely porcelain, sort of creamy porcelain colour. Um, so I had a, had a one or two sort of fungus ID books on the shelf at home that had been gathering dust for a few years since my previous attempt at getting interested in uh, identifying fungi. And I took this one home and tried to identify it. And I only got as far as figuring out that it was some kind of oysterling, some sort of crepidotus something. Um, but I was sufficiently interested in making these observations that I thought I want to capture them somewhere. And that's when I started my blog. So I think one of the barriers to getting into getting into fungi, getting into mycology is there is so much to learn. It's, it's impossible to sort of know what you don't know because none of the books are complete. Uh, so there is this fear of getting things wrong or giving things the wrong name. Uh, and I didn't want to be sort of polluting uh, recording databases and things with all sorts of things that I'd misidentified because I didn't really know what I was doing but I did want to keep track of what I was seeing and uh, that process of trying to identify it so I thought if I if I keep all my observations here on a blog then I can hopefully get some feedback from people learn as I go along um, without having to worry too much about getting things wrong um, with my recording so that's where it all started and that was getting on for five years ago now uh, and the following year, I was really excited that autumn to get out with the Sussex Fungus Group, uh, which is a really sort of a really friendly and knowledgeable group that goes out and uh, undertakes recording visits in various sites across Sussex. Uh, and it's I would really recommend. Obviously, it's very difficult, impossible at the moment with the COVID situation, um, but. In the future, when things get back to normal, getting out in the field with people who really know their stuff, um, who can talk you through the features of, of fungi um, and help you understand that process of, of recognising what you're looking at, figuring out what kind of family of fungi you're in and then what features to look for to identify it to species um, is such a valuable experience. Uh, and it's also just great fun getting out with a group of people who share a fascination with the same same sort of things. Um, and one thing to say about fungi is it's it's a vast kingdom. Uh, so this graphic comes from the State of the World's Fungi Report produced by Q. Um, and one thing to note here is fungi are actually more closely related to animals than they are plants. For a long time, until not that long ago, not much more than, in fact, probably less than 100 years ago, fungi were, were treated as sort of lower, lower degenerate plants, uh, plants that were kind of less interesting than flowers and trees, because um, they didn't, they'd somehow, it was assumed they'd somehow lost the, the ability to photosynthesize. Uh, but that was a complete misunderstanding of what fungi actually are. They're an entirely different kingdom 
Um, they don't have a great deal in common with plants. They have much more in common with animals. Um, fungi can't make their own food from sunlight like plants do. They have to kind of forage for it by um, sending out their mycelia, the hyphae, into the substrate um, and absorbing nutrients from the, from the environment around them. Um, and there's, there's various kind of weird and wonderful groups of fungi that comprise things like molds and water molds, which I won't talk about. Um, but there's two sort of large groups of fungi, which you do come across um, in the sort of field of when you're getting outside and recording. Um, and that's the ascomycota, the, the sort of cup fungi or the spore shooters, and the basidiomycota, uh, which encompass things that you'd recognize like mushrooms and brackets and jelly fungi. So just to sort of go into a bit more what fungi are. One, another thing to mention about them is the, the main sort of body of the fungus, if you like, the sort of day-to-day -day life part of the fungi that's absorbing nutrients and sort of living from day to day, um, we hardly ever see because it exists as something called mycelium, which is a thread-like network that exists in whatever substrate that the fungus is growing in. So typically under the ground or in the leaf litter or in rotting wood, um, fungi exist as mycelium. Um, and you may kind of have had a hint of what, the, what this looks like. If you've ever seen this sort of thing, so these black strands, some people call them black bootlaces, these are actually strands of mycelium, that, that network of fungi that are fused together into sort of thicker highways. Um, and people often recognize this, these black bootlaces as belonging to the honey fungus. So, so when you see mushrooms like this, um, and these are honey fungus, Mushrooms and other sort of fungal fruiting bodies are just the reproductive parts of the fungi. They're, they're kind of put out into the world solely for the purpose of sending forth the uh, fungus's spores. Um, so people will be familiar that plants have seeds and that's how they reproduce. Well, fungi produce spores. Um, and all these weird and wonderful shapes that we see are essentially just elaborate holders for these spores um, that are kind of sent up into the world to, to give the spores the best possible start in life to, to help them disperse. Um, and kind of fungi can take on this incredibly diverse forms um, and structures. Uh, and this is one of the things that makes fungi can make fungi so kind of overwhelming. If you're if you're into natural history, you're into kind of observing and identifying wildlife, fungi can just seem kind of totally overwhelming because there's so many of them and they're so incredibly diverse. And one of the things I say is that if if you're kind of people rarely sort of think, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get into identifying animals. Um because that's a whole kingdom that that's enormous people would normally kind of identify a, a reasonable subset to get into like small mammals or butterflies or something like that um, but with fungi for some reason uh, and myself included it's really easy to think oh just have a crack at the whole lot uh, but what you really need to be able to do is focus in on what particular group of fungi you might be looking at um, and Identifying them gets a lot easier if you if you focus in on particular groups and think, right, I'm going to focus on on getting to know this group um, and understanding the sort of identification identification literature for this group. Uh, and this this graphic that we're looking at comes from this book, uh, Fungi of Temperate Europe, um, and the books contain these incredible visual keys to the different groups and genera of fungi. Uh, and I would definitely recommend them as a tool for sort of navigating your way around the, the fungus kingdom um, and sort of getting an idea of where to start with identification when you found something out in the field. Um, the books are absolutely huge. I've got one here. So they're wonderful books, but they're about 100 pounds. They come as a pair and they're about 100 pounds for the pair. 
uh, which is probably a bit bit steep if you're just sort of wanting to dip a toe in. But those visual keys that I just showed you are free to download for personal and educational use. Uh, you can get them at mycokey.com. So I would definitely recommend downloading those and printing them off to take out with you on any kind of fungus hunts that you fancy going on. Um, so just to go back to those two main groups that I talked about earlier, um, the ascomycetes, the spore shooters, what all these have in common is they, they're not all exactly cup shaped, but they all kind of have their spore surface um, on the outside. And I think that's right. Maybe not all on the outside. Um, but what they do all have in common is they keep their spores in long, thin bags like this. Um, and that structure is common to all of the asco ascomycetes. Um, here's what some ascomycetes look like. So you have to sort of use your imagination when you think that these are all sort of broadly under the category of the cup fungi, um, because you, you get things like these jelly babies down at the bottom left where the cup sort of turned inside out and the spore surface is all on the outside. Um, but some of them are very nicely cup shaped like these scarlet elf cups. Uh, and you can see those at Sussex Wildlife Trust's nature reserve at Woods Mill in the spring. Um, there's a lovely little patch of those by the lake. Um, another, the other kind of big broad category of fungi is the basidiomycetes. Uh, these are the spore droppers um, and mushrooms, which you'll all be familiar with, uh, come into the category of basidiomycetes. And what these fungi all have in common is they all hold their spores on a, on a kind of structure like this with prongs. The spores grow on the end of these prongs and these structures are called Basidia, one plural basidia, one basidium here. Um, and the, the gills are really just to create a huge surface area on which to pack all these spore holders. So this image in the middle gives you a cross section. You're looking at a cross section across the gills here. And then slightly to the right, you're looking at a magnified version of what the edge of those gills look like. And you've got these spore holders at intervals, these basidia, and then there's a close up of what those basidia look like. And at the bottom right, you can see one that's just starting to grow these little spores on the end. And then gradually, as they mature, the spores will just drop off. So in these fungi, it's gravity that really helps spread the mushroom spores. They'll, they'll drop down through these gaps between the gills and then they'll get carried off on air currents. Um, in order to go and spread their spores. Uh, so it's really useful to be aware of those two categories of fungi and, and start to be able to recognise them because that, that will help you navigate uh, any identification books that you might have. Uh, and here's some examples of basidiomycetes or basidios. They can look incredibly variable, um, but what they all have in common is they have those little prongs. Um, with the spores on the end. Um, some mushrooms have pores instead of gills and the, the little holders will be up inside those pores. Um, you get some things like puffballs where it's all packed inside and then it gets splashed out by the rain after they've broken. Um, but, but these are all kind of biologically related. So those are the two broad categories of fungi. And what I wanted, one of the things I wanted to talk about today is observing fungi. Um, and this is one of the things that I find really absorbing about having an interest uh, in mycology. So there we, there we are, the uh, Sussex fungus group. We're all having a look at this flea's ear. Um, there's an ascomycete there, a cup, a cup fungus, um, which perhaps doesn't look, doesn't look hugely exciting, but I love this kind of slightly grubby olive color. Um, and it is, in fact, a, a, a priority species. It's been identified as, as one that's important for sort of conservation concerns. So we're really excited to find that one uh, in some woods near North Chapel. Um, right. And then to kind of talk you through observing fungi, there's the, there's the sort of way that most of us would sort of our go to sense when we're observing things is looking at them. Um, 
And with fungi, you really need to have a good look at them. It's not enough to just look down at a fungus. Um, you see a lot of photos of people that have kind of been captivated by a colorful um, mushroom down on the ground and got a lovely photo of it. Um, but that's not necessarily very helpful when it comes to actually identifying it because you need to look at the whole thing. You typically need to look at the, the stem, the gills, you might need to look at the base of the stem. Um, and if you, if you don't want to disturb what you're looking at, then a little mirror like this can be really handy for, for getting down and having a good look at it. My, often it's not very easy to identify things from, from photographs, but every once in a while you come across a, a fungus that's really distinctive. Uh, and this is one that Michael came across when he was leading a walk at Sussex Wildlife Trust's Burton Mill Pond Nature Reserve. Uh, and he, he came home and he showed me this photo and I remember he described it as looking like a sort of magical kingdom, these sort of wonderful pink caps on these yellow stems seemed really distinctive and we didn't know what it was but we put put a photo out on a, on Twitter on social media uh, and someone from one of the scientists the mycologists from Kew actually responded and said oh my goodness that's that's beautiful bonnet Mycena renati that's a really rare mushroom and it's one of the priority species that we're looking at in a, in a project that they were running. So that was a real coup for Michael. It's one of his photos, not mine. Um, and I went back, sadly, I wasn't with him when he found this. And I went back to try and catch a glimpse of it. But fungi is so often so fleeting, so ephemeral that you have these incredible encounters with them. And they're just impossible to recreate because you go back a few days later and are just gone. So I still haven't seen this one, um, but I was I was very impressed when I went to Q for the uh, a sort of international fungus symposium because I got so obsessed with fungi that I just want to go to all the fungus meetings. Uh, and I was walking past this poster about the conservation project at Q, and I spotted this photo of Michael's. So he's actually got onto got onto a poster at Q with this photo that he just happened to snap while he was out and about. So you kind of never know when you get into observing fungi and recording fungi, when you're gonna come across something that's gonna be really interesting and potentially important for conservation purposes. Because there's really not that many people out and about recording um, and identifying fungi. So any kind of new people coming along, you can make a real contribution. Right, next up. So that was that was looking at fungi. The other thing with fungi is you, you really need to feel them. Um, they have this incredibly diverse array of different textures. So you get slimy ones like this. This is the, the slimy wax cap, which is so sticky. I actually couldn't put this one back down again. I was sort of there with my hand trying to get it off. Um, and that's that stickiness is one of the real key identification features with this one. You get other ones which are, are kind of oily or buttery, um, and you get some which which have a kind of sort of texture like wet dog or something. Um, so that's kind of part of observing fungi is 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 sensing that what texture they've got to their caps and their, to their stems. Um, smelling fungi, this is another really important feature with fungus identification. Um, and fungi can, because they're, they're these sort of fascinating chemical creatures, um, they use chemicals to release nutrients from their substrate and presumably various other things that we don't fully understand. Um, but this is an example uh, of one that you can come across at Sussex Wildlife Trust's Ebono Common Reserve. Um, this is the garlic parachute. And if you're walking through those woods at the right time of year, you might, you might feel your nostrils filled with the smell of garlic. Um, I think, well, hang on, it's not, it's not spring, it's not Ramson season. Um, if it's autumn, it's quite likely you're walking past a big patch of garlic parachute. And these, these guys really do fill the air with their sort of pungent smell of garlic. Uh, and fungi can have just an amazing array of smells from sort of coconut to marzipan to horrible sort of fetid smells that you wish you hadn't smelt, but they're really quite distinctive from an identification perspective. Tasting fungi. Um, now, a word of caution, 
with tasting fungi, going back to my point at the beginning, some are poisonous. Um, so don't just be sort of tasting them willy nilly, but with, with some particular groups of fungi, uh, so particularly milk caps and rustulas, for example, the taste can be a distinctive identification feature. So if you're confident enough to know, right, I've definitely got one of these kind of mushrooms in front of me, then, then taste in that scenario can be an important feature. And that's what's going on here. Um, I am particularly interested in recording wax caps, a kind of grassland fungi. Um, and there's lots of little red ones, but one of the little red ones has a very bitter taste to it. All you have to do is, is touch, touch the tip of your tongue to the cap and you'll get a very kind of strong, bitter taste coming through. Um, and that's, I'm very excited here because I've never, never encountered this fungus before. And that's me, um, that's me identifying the, the bitter wax cap there in a churchyard in East Sussex. Hearing, um, I had to think about this one, but you do get species of fungi that have a distinctive sound to them. And this is one of them, the snapping bonnet. Uh, So-called because if you if you break the stem on this one, it's it's got a particular structure to it that it will give a, a real audible snap. Uh, and if you if you find a mushroom that that looks like this and has that snapping sound to it, then you found snapping bonnet. And a lovely photo there by Jim and Dawn Langwich. The other kind of thing that I love about fungi is they do all this incredible, fascinating stuff. Uh, so you get fungi that will rapidly change colour. So if you're if you're interested in recording beliefs, uh, and this is an example from when I was out on a recording visit with the Sussex fungus group, came across this this belete. Um, and if you look at these in cross section, some of them will will do this very kind of impressive colour changing thing. So it's actually kind of yellow on the inside, but as soon as it's exposed to the air, it will it will flush this deep deep blue. Um, colour due to a sort of process of oxidisation, I think. Um, so you get colour changes, you get fungi that bleed, which sounds rather macabre, but here's, here's me encountering the uh, bleeding bonnets and verifying that these are indeed um, a burgundy drop bonnet. Um, and you get other kinds of bonnets which will which contain a, a sort of really bright saffron, orange coloured liquid um, saffron drop on it. There's another really impressive one that you might come across. You get blushes. This is quite a common bracket fungus to come across, particularly you find it on willows. So you'd see it a lot at Woods Mill. Um, and this is called blushing bracket because if you come across a, a fresh specimen and sort of press your, press your thumb up against it, that's my thumbprint there that's that's turned the the color of the the pores on the underneath a sort of deep deep red sort of blush color so there's a, a sort of key identification feature on the blushing bracket and you get um, a whole kind of group of fungi that have this character called deliquescence um, and these are these are fungi that sort of auto auto digest so they'll kind of dissolve their own um, cap and produce this this kind of sticky inky gloop um, and it is actually written that that these fungi that the sort of black ink that is produced where the spores are kind of splashed down onto the onto the grass and and leaves around them um, is is quite good for writing with. So I've seen I've seen some examples online of, of art that people have done um, with ink from shaggy ink caps, uh, and it produces a lovely sort of browny browny black color. Milk caps. These are an interesting uh, group of fungi in that they all have they all produce this this milk or latex uh, inside their gills, and if you if you sort of cut the gills at all, break them or or snap them then you'll you'll get this milk coming through um, and this is an example of one where where taste is an important identification feature because if you were to taste that milk um, then it would have an extremely wasabi hot taste to it uh, and if you if you were experienced in identifying milk caps and you've got that very strong 
fiery taste to it, then you'd immediately know that what you've got in front of you is a fiery milk cap. You get you get mushrooms that that change colour and are kind of when you first sort of start getting into observing fungi and trying to identify fungi, one of the really confounding features is they can just be so variable in their appearance. And these two mushrooms are from the same species. Um, they're both blackening wax caps, wax caps. But here's here's a small young one that's still almost entirely orange. You can just see a few sort of hints of, of blackening starting to happen there. And then here's here's one that's grown in a much larger form um, that's a bit older and it's gone almost completely black. Uh, and I, I love coming across these. Another name for them is the witch's hat, uh, which I think is really memorable. If you come across this one in its blackened state, um, it's a really fantastic one to see and pops up around Halloween. So it's a really, it's a really nice Halloween-y one to look for. Uh, reactors, let's see what this one does. So another feature of these kind of chemical characteristics that fungi have is some of them will react strongly with particular chemicals um, and it's one of the things that might might make mycologists seem quite uh, quite strange or um, serious in their pursuits and that they, they sometimes go about with all sorts of little bags of chemicals and crystals in their pockets so that they can they can carry out some of these chemical tests in the field. Uh, so that was me there spraying some um, KOH potassium hydroxide, I think, onto this this bracket fungus, which told me immediately that it's cinnamon bracket, um, because that that feature of turning purple is a particular feature of cinnamon bracket. Uh, here's another one that turns purple. Um, it's a crust fungus, and you might think, oh, life is too short to get interested in crusts. Um, but if you get this one under a hand lens, it's just incredible. Look at it. It's like the surface of some alien planet or something with these wonderful sort of yellow teeth poking up from the, the, yellow, the yellow substrate crust there. So I think, you know, hopefully life is long enough to, to get interested in crust fungus. Uh, this one's called Mycoacea uda. Um, you, get, you get fungi which have these kind of really elasticy bits. It's another key identification feature there with the elastic oysterling. You can pull the, the skin on the cap um, all my, and it will just stretch for away. Um, you get jelly fungi. There's lots of different kinds of jelly fungi. This is this is quite a common one that you might come across that you see particularly growing on on older. This is the jelly ear. And one of the things I really like about jelly fungi is there are really good reason to go out for a walk in the rain because they look re they start to look really plump and shiny and um, fabulous when you're out in the rain. Uh, and then you can go out a few days later and they're just sort of all a bit dried up and shriveled and nondescript. Um, there we go. Uh, you get fungi which do this thing called guttation. Uh, I've got no idea why they do this, but it is a feature of, of various different species that they exude water droplets from the fruit body. And this is a really sp spectacular example of that uh, oak bracket. And if that's kind of not enough reason to get interested in fungi, uh, they have a whole range of fascinating microscopic features. Um, and I'm not going to have time to talk you through all of these today, but I thought I'd just give you a, a taster of why people um, get sucked into the study of fungi and mycology and then um, absorbed, get absorbed for hours by the microscope working through these things uh, with keys and things like that. Um, so I, I spoke earlier about how mushrooms, gilled mushrooms, have these structures called basidia or singular basidium on the edge of their gills uh, and the spores kind of grow on the edge of these features. So these are the sorts of things that you're looking for when you're looking under the microscope. Uh, and you might also see other structures um, which are kind of infertile structures in between the basidia uh, called cystidia. This, you're not going to see this down your average microscope at home. This is, a, this is an image from a scanning electron microscope. But I just wanted to give you an idea here of what you're looking at when you're looking between two, what's 
what there is between two gills. This is this is looking between just two gills on a mushroom. Um, and you can see the, the smaller things at the bottom here are all this are all the spores held on the on the ends of the basidia. And then you've got these big structures sticking out, and these are called cystidia. Uh, and in this species, they have a particular sort of structure to them where they have these prongs on the end of the cystidia, which look at, people say they look a bit like deer horns. They don't look that much like deer horns, but you get, kind of get the idea. Um, and that's something you can look for under a microscope that you might have at home. And this this is my this is my first go at microscopy on the top right here. Uh, this is me at looking at some cystidia on a deer shield um, in water. So it's all white there. And then some some time later, I'd got a little bit better at microscope microscopy, and I'd, I think I'd probably got a better microscope. Um, and here's me looking at the same thing, but um, stained stained with a special stain to give them this red color, make them a bit easier to see. So that's that's a nice kind of microscopy 101. Um, and then spores can have this incredible array of different shapes and structures. Um, I particularly like the, the rustulas and the milk caps um, have these spores like those at the bottom left there with with these sort of wonderful net-like patterns on them, which you can see once once you've stained them with a substance called melxiziodine, um, you can you can really bring out these structures. Uh, and these are all images that I've I've taken down the microscope of different things that I found. Uh, and the other fascinating thing about fungi is that just the lives that they lead. And if you're out and about and you see a bit of woods with these kind of black black patterning, black lines on them. Um, the sort of name for this patterning is spalting. And it's actually produced by fungi. These black lines delineate sort of different fungal territories. These are, these are the sort of chemical battle lines between different fungal organisms that are living inside the wood uh, and battling for access to the nutrients in here. Um, and just this sort of thing just, gives you a glimpse of just how much is going on in the world around us that most of the time we're completely unaware of. Um, and of course, people will be aware of mycorrhizal fungi, fungi that grow particularly in association with plants. So I talked before about mycelium, um, the sort of networks of, of fine thread-like um, find thread-like forms that sort of pass through whatever it is that the fungus is growing on, the, the leaf litter or the, or the soil substrate. Um, and in mycorrhizal fungi, those networks connect with plant root networks. Um, and kind of people have, have talked about this being a kind of wood wide web. And there is evidence that, that nutrients are kind of passing in different directions in these, in these um, networks, mycelial networks and connections with plants. Um, and it's a really fascinating area that we just are only just starting to, to understand, I think. And there's a really fantastic book that's just come out recently called Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake. And that talks a lot about the lives of fungi and mycelial networks and what's going on with them. So I'd, I'd thoroughly recommend that book. Um, fungi are doing all sorts of useful things for us. Wood decaying fungi, um, they're recycling all this dead material, kind of releasing all these nutrients back into the environment so they can be used by other things, used by plants. Uh, this is a, a sort of common wood decaying fungus that people might recognize, chicken of the woods. This is one of the brown rotters. Um, and I always get this mixed up. You get brown rotters, which, um, do they? decay the, the cellulose and then white rotters uh, decay the lignin. It's either that way around or the other way around. Um, here's, here's a white rotter, which you might see, jelly rot, which has a really uninspiring name. Um, but if you catch it, catch it at the right time when it's kind of really moist, it's got this lovely sort of salmon pink, pink color to it and a quite a sort of woolly texture to it. And I think it can be really beautiful, um, even with a rubbish name like jelly rot. Um, and fungi are kind of recycling all sorts of other matter for us, 
you get a particular fungi that grow in dung. I was really excited to find this one. This was one I had to get under the microscope and spend a bit of time trying to identify. Um, but it turns out to be one that turned up in uh, Britain relatively recently um, and was, was first recorded from a massive pile of elephant dung in a zoo. Uh, so this is, this is a case of some like it hot in the uh, world of fungi. This is one that really likes a big pile of dung. And that's where I found it. Um, you get this species, which just, I just absolutely love this illustration by um, Sekai Takayama from a, from a Japanese book about fungi, exploring, exploring the mushroom world. This particular fungus specializes in feeding on nutrients in mole latrines. So this mushroom is the mole's toilet cleaner. Um, somehow the mushrooms manage to locate themselves where they have access to all the nutrients um, that are deposited by moles uh, near, to where they're, near to where their nests are. And another kind of really mind blowing feature of this fungus, if you come across it, is it has a really pungent smell of marzipan to it. So just a fascinating species. You get mushrooms that grow in association with algae. I, I can't, I can barely get my head around this, but in broad terms, I think the, the body of the fungus, well, the body is a, is a lichen and then the reproductive parts are mushrooms. It's lichens are sort of mind blowing enough without getting into this business of lichenized fungi, but there you are, that's biology for you. You get parasitic fungi. These are particular uh, type of belete mushroom that you will only find growing with common earth balls. Uh, and this is a photo that I took at Sussex Wildlife Trust's Selwyn's Wood Reserve. Um, we saw that in, in quite good numbers there, although I don't think it's particularly common fungus to find. Um, this is another good one. This is a powdery piggyback. Uh, these, this is the sort of very dead and blackening form of, a, of an old rustular mushroom. Uh, and then growing on that decaying mushroom are these um, this other in, entirely different species of fungus that specializes in, in growing on dead fustulas. You get smuts, uh, which I'm not, I shouldn't even try and get into talking about fungi that associate with, with living plants, because uh, it's just such a, a mind-blowingly fascinating topic. I couldn't, I couldn't help but mention it, but if you, people will, I'm sure lots of you will recognize red campion. Uh, and if you're out and about and walk past a patch of red, red campion, just have a look and see, see if any of them have this sort of strange, dusty, smutty uh, look to them. Um, because if that's the case, then they have been infected by campion anther smut. Uh, and what's happened is the fungus has taken over the plant's sexual reproductive parts for its own purposes. Uh, and it's using them to uh, mature and disperse its own spores. And this is what Campionanthus smut spores look like. These incredible structures with these kind of hexagonal net-like pattern around them. Fascinating things. Um, another species that you might have heard of is ergot. Uh, famously, I think this is, this is what people originally extracted the uh, chemical LSD from. Uh, but in history, it was responsible for untold suffering because it's actually incredibly poisonous uh, and it would get mixed up in rye that people use to mill to make bread and things uh, so people would end up getting poisoned by these things and it has all sorts of horrible um, symptoms like gangrene and kind of burning sensation under the skin so definitely not one you want to mess around with um, but a fascinating life cycle because it produces these sort of black banana like resting spores which will fall to the ground and spend the winter just sort of lying there um, waiting waiting for the following spring to come and then the following spring it will send up these um, tiny little sort of they look a bit like mushrooms but they're actually I think ascomycetes so that so it's got those kind of little sack little sacks filled with spores all around the outside there and it will shoot the spores off to um, we kickstart another life cycle. Right, rusts, this is a good one to look out for. Nettle, 
nettle cluster cup rust, quite a common one. Uh, you'll, you might notice it first because it creates sort of distortion in the leaves, but if you look really closely, it, it produces these really quite beautiful um, sort of crown-like fruit bodies. You get fungi that create galls within plants, um, which is another kind of fascinating, fascinating capability of the fungus kingdom that they can um, influence the, the growth of other organisms. Um, and uh, there's also a kind of whole group of pathogenic fungi that infect, uh, infect living insects. And this is one, uh, Entomophthora, that will not only kind of infect the fly, but kind of influence its behavior. So it causes it to go and perch somewhere high up in this kind of death pose with its wings outstretched uh, so that the fungus's spores, which emerge through the back end of the now dead insect have the, the best chance at dispersal, really quite macabre, but a fascinating biological process. Um, and of course, there are a whole range of fungal pathogens um, which, which disrupt the human environment and disrupt, disrupt uh, the plant kingdom. So this, this is one which we came across on a Sussex fungus group 4A. This is the fungus which causes ash dieback. Uh, this, is, this is everywhere now in Sussex, really quite sobering to, to see how widespread this has become. Um, right, I'm gonna whistle, whistle through the rest of it. Um, just a few things on where to find fungi basically everywhere, um, but different habitats will have different assemblages of fungi within them. So you get particular species in oak woodland. This is a nice one, cramp balls, or you might know it as King Alfred's cakes that grows particularly on ash. Porcelain fungus is a lovely one to come across in beech woodland. Starts off this sort of really soft gray color but turns quite sort of clear white porcelain color as it matures. Um, I'm sure lots of people will have seen this one, the birch polypore or razor strop fungus, which people use historically to sharpen razors. Uh, in coniferous woodland, you get a whole different suite of fungi again. This one's um, Dyer's maize gill, which is one of those species which can look incredibly different depending what stage of its lifestyle you, you catch it at. Uh, this one's so-called because it produces this wonderful array of colors in, in dyeing. You get species in bogs, parks and gardens, earth stars are a lovely, lovely one to come across. In grassland, you get lots of different fungi, but many people will know this one, the parasol, um, which can come up in kind of large groups in fields in the autumn. My favorites, the wax caps, which you find particularly in, in really old grasslands. That have, either, that have been kept short either through grazing or mowing in churchyards, for example. Um, there's some white spindles popping up in my local churchyard. Uh, and sand dunes as well have their own assemblage of fungi, um, which was a surprise to me, but I don't know why, because fungi turn up everywhere, including in my bathroom. Uh, and this one's the plant pot dappling, which I was very excited to come across a while ago. Um, and then I was just going to finish off with some tips, really. Uh, if, if this has sort of kindled an interest in, in fungi, then get yourself a book. I particularly recommend that one on the left, which is, which is the one that's sort of the right size to carry around. All of the others are a bit big. Um, get out on a fungus foray. Obviously, it's difficult at the moment, but there are... There are some, some really nice sort of virtual fungus forays going up online that you can see on YouTube to uh, get you started during these uh, COVID times. Join your local fungus recording group. Um, Sussex Fungus Group is, is one we've got here. Uh, and get out in the woods and enjoy it. This is, this is a photo from one of my favorite places to go looking for fungi. Um, this is Sussex Wildlife Trust's Ebono Common Reserve. Uh, and it's just wonderful at this time of year um, because it's, it's kind of known for being internationally important for its uh, fungal diversity. So you, there's always something incredible to see there. Uh, and I think that's it. I don't know if Michael's still here. Yeah, still here, still going. Yeah, I'm still awake. Um, 
because you thought I fell asleep there, didn't you? But um, yes, thank you. That, that, uh, that was amazing, Claire. Very, really, very really inspiring. Thank you very much. You all right? Did you enjoy that? Yes, thanks. As I mentioned at the, uh, at the start of the talk, Claire's put together um, a little list with a load of links, uh, which will link you. There's, uh, she's a link to her blog uh, talking about how to observe, identify, and record fungi. Uh, Claire's put a list together of her favorite books. People are asking for their Christmas uh, to put things on their Christmas list. So uh, there's a list of, um, of Claire's favorite books she recommends. Also, Claire mentioned that lovely uh, that chart you can see on the, on the top left there, which is, uh, is uh, free and downloadable. So there's a link to, uh, to download that. There's also, I'll put a link to uh, our upcoming uh, Wildlife Trust talks. We've got uh, um, many more talks coming up in December. There's, uh, there's winter birds, there's thrushes, there's uh, uh, dragonflies coming up. There's going to be a talk about uh, coastal plants at Rye Harbour. So if you want to register on those, they're all free to register and uh, there'll be a link for that later on.